uh, all of these different accusations that you know have come out of the wokeism playbook just expect them to you know get thrown around more and more and to become less and less relevant to whatever it is that they're actually talking about mm -hmm. Hello and welcome to Mind Matters, everyone. Oh, hold on, a, hold on a sec. Check that. I think your camera angle is off a bit. Uh, is it? Hold on, let me look. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's fix that. I don't I don't know how that happened. All right, there we go. Sorry, folks. That technical difficulties there. Don't know what was it's going on. It's just the awesomeness of the T-shirt. Just it's gravity. The gravity of the weight of its awesomeness. Yes. It just pulled the camera down. <laughs> okay. Glad we got that fixed. All right. Good. But wait, wait a minute. What, what, uh, what, what does your T-shirt say, Adam? What, what is that? Oh, that it, it just says uh, Urta rule, and then it's got a little symbol here. Is that the <laughs> Kai tribe? Yes, it it is the the symbol for the the Kai tribe. I see. Uh, okay. Because because that's where Urta rule is from, and so that's why they have it on his on his name there. <laughs> Very yeah, good. Uh, Sweet well, T-shirt. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, maybe we'll, we'll have to do a show on Urta Rule one day, I think. We've got a couple already, Elon. Don't you remember? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Weren't you, well, it's weren't just you such there a, for those? It's just such a great <laughs> show. I, uh, I want to talk about it again. But not today. Not today. So with that. Uh, so with that, all said and done, um, this week we're going to be uh, going over a couple of things, uh, one of which is uh, this uh, little bit from uh, James Lindsay's New Discourses, uh, where he talks about wokeness as the lockpick to the gates of Western civilization, uh, going over kind of what he means by that, and also the uh, implications moving forward. Uh, because this, some, this is something that I think we all should be paying attention to is uh, the transformation because it's it's one thing for for wokeness to exist as an ideology and for it to get pushed forward but as the implementation continues to move forward it's going to change it's it's an uh, its initial aim and initial purpose has essentially already been accomplished um, so what it's going to be used for going forward is going to change and we need to you know kind of pay attention to how that change is coming about and and what that change looks like um so just as kind of a, a brief summation of what uh, james spoke about in his um uh, little video clip was the uh critical social justice theory um or wokeness was the lockpick to Western civilization. So what, did it, what does it mean to have a gate to Western civilization? What does it mean to be the lockpick? Well, the gate to Western civilization was the culture because this was uh, theorized by Antonio Gramsci, I think is his name, mm -hmm. is an Italian. Albanian Italian. Iba Albanian Italian. Oh, you can't trust those Albanians. Um, who theorized that part of the reason why in Western societies there was not this uh, uprising of the proletariat against the bourgeoisie was that the the strength of the culture was was too great uh, to uh, allow for any kind of destruction of that culture. Uh, they were essentially too cohesive. There was not this great... Uh, swath of disenfranchised uh, you know everybody you know they were they were english they were uh french etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, and that was who they were and so they didn't need something else to try and give them an identity because they already had one uh so that's what the gate uh in the gates of western civilization means it was uh the door barring the revolution from coming and turning you know these western countries into communist states uh, and then now there's the lockpick, and the lockpick is critical so so social justice theory. Uh, and what it was trying to do was undermine the culture of Western states such that it would allow for Western cultures 
to be infiltrated and destroyed to the extent that they could be subverted and the states taken over uh, by communists, essentially. Um, so that was kind of his idea uh, as to what wokeness was really meant and intended to do. It meant it was intended to subvert the culture, to infiltrate the culture, subvert it, destroy it, weaken it, so that way uh, it could be infiltrated and you know taken over. Uh, he argues that it is more or less complete, and I would dare say that uh, I agree uh, to a large extent because... One of the things about Western civilization, like what it was that prevented things from devolving into a, a communist state was uh, the values of personal private property, individual rights, uh, which preceded government. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Uh, you know, the thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um which those unalienable rights are above and precede the government, which is, you know, again, outside of, or not again, it is outside of the realm of what a communist would say, because all, all things are given to and by the state, um, as opposed to being given by God, uh, due process of law as another value. Um, so these are things that created a, an impediment for communist revolution and communist takeover. And so these are some of the very things that we see being destroyed uh, on principle by critical social justice theory because it is, those values are based on the, um, I guess, the principle of equality. Not equity, but equality. Uh, equality of opportunity specifically. Um, whereas the, the critical social justice theory, uh, in, in its critiques of, of all of the ills of Western civilization, Western civilization has said that that is one of the fundamental problems is the, the fundamental problem of equality, uh, is unattainable. And so it should be discarded in pursuit of equity. Never mind that. You know, the search for equity is a total pipe dream, an impossibility, and we know this uh, through, you know, examining history. But nevertheless, that is uh, what they say. And so the, the wokest march towards changing of the cultural narrative to push for equity as opposed to equality is or has been one of its main points one of its main reasons for being uh and it and it's accomplished that to a great extent i believe um because now we have i mean i was listening to one of the you know biden administration people who knows i don't remember who it was there, there's just so many and they're all so diverse i can't <laughs> i can't, can't tell them apart. <laughs> yeah they're so diverse i can't tell them apart uh, but they were saying, you know, we've got the, the Climate Justice Equity Office of Climate Change Equity Justice, which is like, I have no idea what the heck you're talking about and what this is supposed to be. Uh, but nevertheless, this is a new department within our government that is specifically aimed at equity. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, like, this is the infiltration right in front of your eyes. Um, so if, do you ha do you guys have anything mm -hmm. you want to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, um... A couple points. Well, first, I want to expand a bit on the idea that uh, that the goals have al already already been achieved in a sense. Um, so we've been talking about ideologies and the kind of progression of them in in several episodes. And the thing about wokeness is it resembles to a, a great degree, like. In the examples you mentioned, the, the various communist ideologies and the way they've been put into practice in the 20th century, for the most part. And the point that I've made a few times in reference to Mao is the, uh, specifically in reference to Mao, but not just, is the impossibility of the goals of the of the ideology, which you alluded to. So, in in a sense, 
the you pointed out a, a funny contradiction that the they see the equality goals of like a, a liberal culture as impossible in some sense and so replace them with uh an even more impossible uh goal which which would be equity so when you have an impossible goal then there is there can always be a motivation and a drive to pursue that goal and it will be never ending so in, in a sense it's a it's like a, a free energy machine. It just it it constantly provides the the energy for more progress and more change, which will never be achieved. And therefore, any means necessary can be used to pursue that goal, which will never be achieved. Be achieved, which means those means can always be used, and those means will become increasingly repressive and oppressive as this progresses. But there's a characteristic. Uh, there are a few characteristic qualities and phenomena about ideologies and their adherence that that progress and that you can see by looking at the historical record and with a guide like um, you know if you look at if you read ponderology and you can you can see what what's actually going on with these ideologies so it starts out with an ideology which on the surface is what it says it is so you have nowadays we have wokeness and we have the the goals of wokeness which a lot of people have um on this have taken at face value and say okay well I've, I've adopted these goals and these values now for myself and i want to achieve them now you could call these people the like the you know some of them are are decent people or good-hearted and and have just gotten caught up in it and and become um you know, a bit, a bit messed up in the head by virtue of just having adopted this crazy ideology. But when it comes down to it, they don't, uh, they don't necessarily want to see uh, like gulags and the, and their families, you know, put in prison or anything like that. No, some of them do, and some of them, like, of course, it would be nice to know the numbers. But you have the the dupes or the useful idiots or you know the people that are that just genuinely believe the ideology, and um, or that have that have come to believe it because they've been propagandized, because they've been, um, you know, educated by by the people pushing the ideology. The p people pushing the ideology, m most of them and many of them are also true believers with slightly slightly different motivations because they're the ones that, uh, well, they've got the most drive behind them because they are the ones actually um, creating and promoting the ideology. Now... That's only like a, a first phase of the ideology, and and the 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 first goals in the pursuit of the the ends, the the aims, and the goals of that of that ideology are to get power, to get into power, to be able to implement it, to be able to to turn the theory into practice, and to be able to start getting um, real results. That has happened over the last 10, 20 years. <clears throat> Through the infiltration of the, like the entire educational system, and well, as we've talked about in previous shows, pretty much every institution in Western civilization, and spe uh, specifically in like uh, the, the 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 frame of reference for us is like the United States and Canada, but not just United States and Canada. It's it's pretty much um, worldwide to a degree, but in the in the English speaking world and in the you know the the, the Western world in particular. Or in 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 the in the wider sense, but you see the language everywhere, even even coming out of uh, like countries that wouldn't be considered that. Like you see social justice ideology coming out of um, like Chinese state media, um, usually as a um, as a uh, as a criticism of Western governments. Like they've they've adopted it as as a, a means of of criticizing the West. It's like oh well, here this seems to be working, so we'll we'll use it too. Um, so you constantly see um, foreign countries uh, criticizing Western countries for their white supremacy, white supremacy and uh, racial discrimination and systemic racism and things like that. So it's become global in that sense, uh, too. But um, so all the all the institutions, education, um, the the justice system, um, youth organizations like Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, uh, the government, pretty much every, like, you know, you talked about all these new, um, all these new departments that are springing up. Um, every corporation, every religious institution, religious institution, it's pretty, it's pretty much everywhere. And of course, um, 
even small businesses who might not be big enough or have the inclination to have a you know div diversity inclusion and equity board or or whatever um, will then be subject to the to cancel culture and the like having their their having their business dry up or or uh, be boycotted because of a social media campaign etc you know things like that so that could be like the in, in a sense that part of the goal has been completed there the the ideology has managed to infiltrate to every aspect of um, of society of of our even of culture um, Hollywood you know the Hollywood the media um, TV which is also Hollywood um, music entertainment like every every uh, the media every aspect of of culture it's it has been infiltrated and it's inescapable like you see it everywhere so what is the the goal from then on well if you're just looking at it um, from the surface then you could just see oh well that will just progress and now we'll have like so the the useful idiot response might be okay well now that everything everyone's in in these positions well things will just either get better or kind of stay the same or or get or get worse but but there you can't look at it just just um, using those same categories. There are other things going on. So that's what I think um, James Lindsay is talking about when he says that now wokeness is only like 15% of the problem. Because, well, I'll give my perspective on that now, is because I mentioned all of the, 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 the true believers and the kind of the, the fellow travelers and the people that kind of adopt it because it sounds like a good idea and because they've indoctrinated to think it's a good idea um, and because it seems to align with what they think their values are. And But then there are the people who actually don't believe the the propaganda. The, the, there's something going on beneath the surface of this ideology, just like there was behind communist ideology. So... Um, I think I'm going to read a few paragraphs from Political Ponderology just to give an, uh, an idea of where I'm coming from. So these are from a couple of the sections on ideologies that Lobachevsky writes. So he writes, an ideology of a secondarily ponderogenic association. So this is a group or movement that um, adopts an ideology that is influenced to a large degree by um, psychopaths and you know, people with other personality disorders. That's what he calls a secondary uh, ponderogenic association. So this ideology is formed by gradual adaption of the primary ideology. This would be wokeness in this case, social justice, to functions and goals other than the original formative ones. So no longer the surface definitions of diversity, inclusion, and equity, as crazy as those might be on their own, a certain kind of layering or schizophrenia of ideology takes place during the polarization process. Polarization as is as the ideology and the movement becomes more saturated with um, bad actors. The outer layer, closest to the original content, is used for the group's propaganda purposes, especially regarding the outside world, although it can in part also be used inside with regard to disbelieving lower echelon members. The second layer presents the elite with no problems of comprehension. It is more hermetic, generally composed by slipping a different meaning into the same names. Since identical names signify different contents depending on the layer in question, understanding this double talk requires simultaneous fluency in both languages. So we, all, we already see a, uh, a double talk even on the what I what I might consider even the first layer of the of social justice because um, well Lindsay on new di on new discourses has an entire lexicon like a, an encyclopedia or dictionary of words with what they what the word is and what it actually means mm -hmm. so there's a, a very specific and non intuitive definition for all kinds of normal words in social justice like wokeness so racism actually means something different Inclu inclusion means something different diversity means something different. So when people see these words, they think they know what they mean, and because they sound like good words, they think they agree 
with the ideology when in fact they're agreeing with something that's actually completely different than what they think it is. So, average people succumb to the first layer's suggestive insinuations for a long time before they learn to understand the second one as well. Anyone with certain psychological deviations, especially, as if, if, especially if he is wearing a mask of normality, with which we are already familiar, familiar that's like the, the psychopathic mask of sanity, pretending to be something that you're not when behind you're actually hiding a, a very like depraved nature, as in, in the example I've brought up many times in uh, serial killers, who present a mask of sanity like Ted Bundy uh, to his victims, only to reveal what he's actually after, which is something completely different and having uh, no congruence with the image he presents of himself. So anyone with certain psychological deviations immediately perceives the second layer to be attractive and significant. After all, it was built by people like him. Comprehending this double talk is therefore a vexatious task, provoking quite understandable psychological resistance. This very duality of language, however, is pathognomonic, um, like characteristic of this specific disease, is a pathogno pathognomonic symptom indicating that the human union in question, the movement, is touched by the ponderogenic process to an advanced degree. So when you see this kind of double talk going on, you know that that the the movement itself has been degraded um, and infiltrated itself by psychopaths and personality disordered individuals to a large degree. So that's kind of what's what's going on. And then a bit further on, he expands on this and says, the main ideology succumbs to symptomatic deformation. In keeping with the characteristic style of this very disease, um, and with what has already been stated about this matter, you know, previously in the book. So it basically, he's just saying it follows a characteristic pattern, um, this, this deformation of the ideology. The names and official contents are kept, but another completely different content is insinuated underneath, thus giving rise to the well-known double talk phenomenon within which the same names have two meanings, one for individuals or one for initiates, one for everyone else. The latter, the one for everyone else, is derived from the original ideology. The former, the one for initiates, has a specifically pathocratic meaning. Pathocracy meaning rule by the diseased, essentially, or the sick. Something which is known not only to the pathocrats themselves, but also by those people living under long-term subjection to their rule. So, I'll read the paragraph before that, too. Uh, thus, a well-developed pathocratic system no longer has a clear and direct relationship to its original ideology, which it only keeps as its primary traditional tool for action and masking, that is, masking its true nature, for practical purposes of pathocratic expansion. Um, or no, okay, that's, that's irrelevant. We don't need to talk about that. So, what you have is the original ideology, in this case, wokeness, social justice theory, um, the the push for diversity, inclusion, and equity. And once the once the double talk phenomenon has ex has uh, shown itself to any significant degree, and once they achieve power, the thing is that ideology then becomes obsolete. So all the people that actually believe in that ideology, it's no longer it's no longer serving their purposes. So when when the when the woke actually gain power, it won't be the, the true believers who actually reap the benefits of woke ideology. Woke ideology will then be used as a, in, a, in a completely caricaturish manner, and, which is amusing and, well, and depressing because it's so caricaturish to begin with. But this is, uh, this is where I think that um, it would be good to have a, a novel or a movie or a TV show, like a, a futuristic dipo, uh, dis, uh, dystopic, um, kind of like 1984 Brave New World-esque um, presentation of this to show what that might look like because people don't seem to, to have the imagine to, imagination to, to project how that might look, um, mm -hmm. to, to see basically a woke, um, a, a woke totalitarianism where in the name of diversity, inclusion, and equity, 
those words are used simply to destroy anyone that gets in the way of the ideology with like with zero connection to the actual ideology or the words themselves akin to for example in like the soviet union during during the the stalinist purges or in mao's china where the where you could be arrested and charged with something that that you couldn't even conceivably that like a case couldn't even conceivably be made that that there's any connection between what you did and what you're charged with um, at least in in the current day people can make the argument you might not agree with the argument but you can at least see the paralogic of the argument you can see for example why um proud boys or um you know or any kind of uh, right-wing group might be associated with certain crimes or certain labels you can see how it makes sense but when um when adherence to the original ideology when woke people themselves are then charged with the exact same crimes with themselves being white supremacists with uh themselves you know um i, w I wish i was better at the you know at just putting on the lingo but i can't do it you know charged with um domestic terrorism well domestic terrorism or but it'd be more like uh a black head of you know the black lives matter movement doing something whatever it is and then getting charged with uh promoting white supremacy yeah. and that doesn't necessarily have to be uh anything like it could just be the promotion of like wanting a family like among the black community like a black member of the black lives matter movement mm. could say i think you know black men and black women should have sit down and have families yeah. and then mm -hmm. they get charged with promoting the patriarchy promoting white supremacy and then you know that's that's i think kind of how what you're talking about this can go uh, in terms of like they're getting charged with something that has very little to no relation whatsoever to the actual well it could be that like the the woke government puts in into effect a woke law or policy that ends up hurting minorities in some way mm -hmm. And then, like the the Black Lives Matter activist says, this is hurting black people. This is hurting our community. And then they go to prison for promoting white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Like that's the kind that's the yeah. level of disconnect yeah. that this kind of that this will lead to, to the point where all of the original adherents to to woke ideology are now they're they're now living in their own crazy world. Whereas the you know all the non-believers were already already living in a crazy world. Now it's now when the when when the movement turns on on them then that's that's kind of a well it it will be a shock and I'm, it's already happened to to certain to a certain degree i mean it, it nothing nothing huge nothing to the extent of like you know the 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 stalinist purges or anything like that but you have had woke individuals who have been canceled themselves because for for um breaking some kind of woke taboo and then, you know, feeling the wrath of the of the woke on them. Hello again, everyone. Uh, just a little brief interruption here. Uh, we had originally recorded, uh, you know, the second half of uh, the show you were just watching. Uh, and then uh, after editing it, we had some perfect fodder for what we were just discussing uh, in the form of GameStop and all of the rhetoric coming out uh, being defamatory of it. So we just had to uh, bring it to you guys and edit this show to include it because, I mean, it was just such a perfect example of what we were talking about. You just can't not include it. So, And it's epic. <laughs> yeah, and it's totally epic. Maybe, could one of you guys just give a really brief rundown, like really short for anyone that might not know what's going on on Wall Street? Sure. So... um Actually, what happened was this. You had a group of indi individuals communicating on a Reddit group who had decided together to counteract uh, what was a, um, a massive short selling by a hedge fund. And what this means basically is that you have these companies who pull together uh, a lot of money and bet against 
a particular corporation doing well. So what they do is they anticipate or they create reality on the ground by short selling or borrowing stock in a particular company in the hopes of selling it later uh, when the price has gone down. And they basically drive the price down. So they target companies for elimination, you might say. It's a, it's a kind of, uh, short selling is pretty common in Wall Street, but it's also a feature of uh, vulture capitalism. Like banking on the failure of other companies and businesses. It, it is, that's a good way to explain it. And what happens quite often is that you have the most outspoken and brazen individuals who run hedge funds coming out and, and poo-pooing the, uh, the future of a particular company in order to drive the price down, in order to facilitate their manipulations. So getting back to uh, this, this group on Reddit, they decided what they would do with this company called GameStop is buy it long. They would drive the price up and counteract the short selling that the hedge funds were attempting to do. And this was, uh, this was a kind of a uh, Main Street meets Wall Street battle of, of wills where you had uh, thousands, probably tens of thousands of individuals investing a lot of money and driving the price up which creates what's called a short squeeze where the people who are investing in the prediction that the price would go down uh, would actually be forced at some point to, to pay for their losses. Um, there are probably better explanations of that, but the, the main gist of it is that you have a lot of individuals who have caught on to the games of Wall Street. And probably one of the most uh, interesting, entertaining elements to this whole story was when uh, apps like Robinhood, which facilitate retail traders, which, which help the everyman to buy stock, decided to close or uh, forestall any more trades uh, in GameStop. Uh, precisely because there were so many people going in and, and, and buying it and driving the price up and making the hedge funds uh, effectively lose money uh, in the near future. So everybody paid attention to this and realized that, well, there's something quite wrong with the game here. There's something going on that is uh, that reveals how markets in the US and in the West actually work. And that is that they're all geared towards the, the kind of monopoly capitalism, vulture capitalism, that is, that's is that been set up to make the rich much richer and the common person less likely to acquire any kind of personal wealth. So. What's at least as interesting as this story is how it's being covered in the news. And with that, we saw a very interesting <laughs> bit of spin on this whole story that speaks directly to uh, wokeness and critical race theory and how it manages to insinuate itself into every kind of public discussion or, or event of, uh, of news and, Im and importance. So, uh, did we want to pull that up? That, well, that before we pull that up, yeah, I just want to give a bit more background and detail. So, well, just a few more details just to round out the picture. So, we've got a few players so far, right? We've got the Reddit investors. We've got the Wall Street hedge fund douchebags. We've got the uh, we've got GameStop, of course, which is like a I'm pretty sure. It's it's just is it just a brick and mortar like game yeah, game much. store so it's not like an online right. store or anything it's like a, a store kind of like Toys R Us or or um, you know Blockbuster but for video games so you can go in and you can buy video games and so these hedge funds were basically banking on GameStop's 
failure, like so their stock's going to go down and they're going to get rich. And so the, the Redditors are like, well, we like GameStop. We don't like what we're seeing. We're going to invest in GameStop and the price is going to go up. And because the price goes up, that means the hedge funds will lose money, like you said. And if it goes up a lot, they could lose a lot of money. Because, well, I, I don't know all the details, but I think there might even be like time limits. Like, well, you're holding this stock and the higher it goes up, the more you'll have to pay if it stays high, right? So the all the people that are shorting it, like in order to to lose as little money as possible, they sh they they're incentivized to to get out when it's you know as it's rising because there's the risk that they'll they'll it'll rise even further even higher then they'll have to pay even more money. So they they were really put in a bind by all these Reddit investors, but and so the the irony or the funny thing about it is that the tables were totally turned because usually it's the hedge fund that you know have you by the short hairs or that manipulate markets and get away with with this kind of thing and here it is a bunch of redditors who aren't necessarily wealthy they could just be investing 20 bucks 50 bucks 100 200 dollars as opposed to like the billions that hedge funds do and manage to um well some of these hedge funds and like you know big capital groups or whatever and on wall street have lost billions of dollars so far at least that's what i've read like some and some people, some like I think I saw one lost like fifty three billion, another like twenty seven billion or something. So it's it can actually have effects. Now what happened right away was, like you said, uh, Robinhood, the app that allows just regular people to buy and sell stocks, uh, limited, like so people who who got in early and bought stocks found that they could not buy any more; they could only sell. They could only, I think, a week later or a few days later, they made it so that you could only buy like one, you know, one stock or something. You couldn't buy multiple shares, and then, and they did that for multiple stocks too. So they limited trading on multiple stocks, which um, seems pretty shady. And it's, so it's not so now. So those are the, some of the players. There are a few more players. Um, there, or, well, there's also they. There were there was the Reddit subreddit itself there was uh, a facebook associated w with it i believe like uh for i think it's the, the reddit is wall street bets is that what it's called mm -hmm. <clears throat> so right away um i think it was in in the day or two after the facebook page was shut down and it was shut down be well that was shut down perhaps because of just uh another one of those facebook um ai like keyword catchers to to find racism, sexism, and whatever, because they were using words like loss porn, you know. So nothing to actually do with porn, but it was, but it, just the word. So it, it got it got shut down because of like threats of of sexual violence or something like that. Like even though it had nothing to do with actual, um, you know, anything actually related to whatever mm -hmm. the terms of uh, of use or content on Facebook are. So there was that, and then there were I can't remember what. Did one message board or something get shut down? What was the one because of? There was one because of sexism. Well, there was the the Discord server. The Discord server. That's yeah, right. The Discord yeah. server got shut down for uh, hate speech and white supremacist language, uh, and I think like one or two other things that were totally absurd. Yeah, I think uh, sexism was one of them. Sexism, yeah. I think, was possibly one of them. Somebody that I had looked at uh, found whatever like. Uh, text or audio or whatever was being used in that uh in that case to shut that server down mm -hmm. and said that the audio wasn't even from the actual discord server that they had shut down so it's it's shady on so many different levels well this is what we we're talking about <clears throat> you know earlier in the show which we recorded several days ago where th there's a kind of progression to how these kinds of things work. I think I mentioned something like um, we're at the point nowadays, and we have been, where a case can uh, a case can be made, you know, for how these accusations play out. That seems reasonable on the surface, like right? because there there does seem to be at least a correlation between the charge and the and the actions. Not always, of course. Um, there's sometimes stuff just gets made up, but in this case, you have even like I'm just gonna like take the censors at their at their word and say let's say there was sexist stuff on this board. Well, it seems to me that 
that sexist stuff probably was always there. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's kind of like a culture thing. Like these, like these Wall Street uh, betters on this site were apparently like as bro as you could get, right? So there's going to be a lot of offensive language and stuff going on there. So what happens is you've got this kind of uh, Wall Street bet culture, whatever it is, and even if even if you don't like it, you know, whatever. But it's been there for years, probably. I don't know how long the the subreddit has been around for. And then their Discord server, which has also been around for a while. People have, have been talking on there the way they talk for months, if not, you know, years, however long it's been around. So why do they get shut down that day, mm-hmm. right as this is all happening? It seems very convenient. And not only that, of course, the Facebook page, why on that day? And or in those few days following. And then um, I think now bring up one of those tweets. Um, I can't remember which one it was. Yeah, the other one. So here, let's read. What does the headline say? Far right extremists use GameStop chaos to radicalize and recruit on Telegram. So Elijah Schaefer writes, uh, uh, it's all too predictable. You know, anything that goes against globalism, fights against degeneracy, or helps the common man get ahead is linked to white supremacy and the far right. So here, now. So Discord, Telegram, Facebook, Reddit, there have been these accusations. Um, again, you know, there might be some justification for them. Um, whether or not you, th- you know, I don't agree that that justification necessarily is, um, means there should be any kind of action taken against it. Um, because I'm, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty hardcore, like advocate of free speech, but, um, you know, even speech I don't like. But all of these avenues of communication tied to this phenomenon, this GameStop short-selling phenomenon, are being mm-hmm. uh, targeted, mm-hmm. either with being shut down or just with the just with the accusations and then the headlines about them. And they're all coming now. Again, this stuff, this language that they're using has probably been around for months or years, and they're all taking it. They're all getting hit by it now and being accused of it now. So tying this back to what I said is said earlier is that it's almost like um it, the dynamic playing out is the is can be seen in the micro microcosm with like a single individual on twitter where if you scroll through anyone's twitter page chances are you're going to find something offensive whether it's one year back two years back three four five you know ten years back you're going to find something that can be, that can be used against them um to tarnish their reputation because they you know they said something that maybe even wasn't offensive back when they said it, but it's now offensive. And that can be used to destroy their reputation and, and uh, destroy their career or whatever. So what seems, the, the way I see what's happening is that anything, any of these isms that can even even implausibly be used against someone or plausibly, it's like they're held in reserve. It's like I, now at the, at the moment I need it, I can then unleash this on them to destroy them. And so the fact that this Wall Street bets thing got big and they were taking on Wall Street and taking on these hedge funds, it's like, oh, well, now I've got you, you know, mother flubber, mm-hmm. you know, we because look at all this stuff I've got in you. Now I'm going to hit you with everything I've got. Mm-hmm. It's if it was, if there was any actual real justification for it, then it would be dealt with at the time. It's the, the fact that they're dealing with it now shows that that's not the reason that it's happening. If that was the reason for, if, if sexism was really the issue on the, on the discord server, or if, um, um, you know, white supremacy was really issue, the issue on, on telegram, then those things would have been dealt with already. The fact that they're all being dealt with right now, only when there's publicity around the thing shows that there's another agenda, at least to me, that seems obvious. Just like, um, it would it would be the same with any with any individual. Like let's say let's say someone runs for office who someone doesn't like, and the day after they run for office, you know they get they get all these lawsuits filed against them for things from five, ten, fifteen years ago. It's like, well, where, where's all this stuff coming from? If there if there was a crime committed in the past, you know, why why is it only coming to light now when they happen to be running for office? It's not a perfect example, but it's the you know it's a similar dynamic going on. So 
bring up that other one too. So just, you know, within the same, within a day or two, we see this other tweet, tweet, which is unrelated to GameStop, but you can see it. So this is the Washington Post. Opinion, guns are white supremacy's de- deadliest weapon. We must disarm hate. So this guy, Dave Smith, literally everything, literally everything that goes against the establishment is now white supremacy. So again, guns, either you love guns or you hate them, but they've been an issue forever. It's like now there's now there has to be a link between guns and white supremacy. Well, it's it's one of those... This, again, is one of those things where there can be, you can plausibly make a link to it. I'm sure there are some actual white supremacists that like guns. Like, it's kind of pretty obvious. It's probably a, a, a certainty. <laughs> but, first of all, when they say white supremacy, they don't mean white supremacy. White supremacy does not mean what you think it means. Like, mo- most people know what white supremacy is and don't like it. Because... I mean, it's just, it, it's a, it's an obvious thing and it's a, it's a, it's almost a universal cultural, um, norm and value not to like white supremacy. When they say white supremacy, they're talking about systemic racism and that everyone, every, everyone and everything essentially is white supremacist because we live in a certain culture, just because of the, the, the systemic nature of the, of our society and our culture and, and, and uh, the, just the history of humanity. You can't not be a white supremacist unless you are one of the oppressed. And if you're, if you are a minority who disagrees with critical race theory or identity politics, then you are also white supremacist, even if you're not white. And Uncle Tom. Yeah. And what what are the? I can't remember if it was Washington Post too, or or some other you know mainstream newspaper that had to come out with the word what multiracial whiteness. Mm. It's because. It's not just white people anymore who are <laughs> who are you know racist white people. It's all these other colored people who are also you know uh, tainted by whiteness and it, and white supremacy. It's like a self hating Jew for uh, any <gasps> Jewish person who happens to be critical of Israel. You, you must hate your you must be a self hating Jew mm-hmm. if if you're in any way critical of Israel. Yeah, so it's it's all just <clears throat> total nonsense. But what we see what we see is um holding these things in reserve so it's so that they can be um taken out of your pocket whenever you need them so oh this group now is making trouble for some kind of establishment institution could be you know wall street today it could be you know city hall tomorrow whatever um any kind of government any kind of other big corporation and then that group will then be targeted for these very reasons because you can like with a person on Twitter, you can always find something. That's the beauty of identity politics is that you can always find something, mm-hmm. even if it's not there. And that's the the progression is that it gets to the point where even if there is literally nothing there, they'll find it. They'll create it. They'll manufacture it. And you can't escape it because like um, like critical race theories, whites, uh, white supremacy, you you can't not be a white supremacist if they accuse you of being one. It's it's kind of like a a nationwide Kafka trap where you get accused of it and nothing you say can absolve you, can absolve yourself of it um, after you've been accused of it. It's just taken as a given, um, something to just be assumed to be true, and any denial of that accusation on the part of the accused is taken as further proof of their guilt. So it's an impossible situation and it's perfect for the establishment. It's perfect for like these Wall Street guys. It's perfect for the people in power. It's perfect um, <clears throat> but because it can be it can be doled out and used whenever convenient, whenever they need it to be used. When you have this category that's so loose that you can accuse anyone of infringing upon, then it's an it's a, a very easy way to take out your enemies and people so a lot of the people that i think i mentioned are kind of like the the naive believers and you know dupes and useful idiots the people that think there's actually um there are actual like liberal values behind something like critical race theory mm-hmm. they're they're the ones that don't realize that the kind of people that wield this as a 
as a weapon are not the kind of people you want to be friends with. In fact, they, they probably are your enemies and they're, they will turn it on you as well. Because you'll get caught up in the, in the um, collective, collective guilt and collective punishment. Because that's, that's also a thing with, these kind, with, with cancel culture and with identity politics and all this stuff is that when you see people in terms of their group identity then any member, any individual that can be either plausibly or implausibly placed within that group can then be blamed along with the whole group. Well, they can be blamed along with the whole group. Any individual can be blamed, any, and the whole group can be blamed for the, what any individual does. So you have this, um, and this is why communism was so atrocious, in the 20th centuries, because that's this is exactly what the the Bolsheviks and and Mao did, is blamed an entire class of people simply f- for some barely like surface level group identity. It was the Kulaks in Russia, and it was like um, pretty much you know anyone in in China. If if you if you it got to the point after the Great Leap Forward where if you disagreed or did anything against the against Mao's policies Mao himself or his subordinates would label you a, a rightist or a revisionist or a capitalist um subversive or whatever even if you were just a farmer trying to make a few extra dollars by selling something on the street because you couldn't make enough you know working on the collective farm so you get grouped in with a, a class of people judged because of that class. And even if, even if that group didn't do anything wrong, even if it's just a convenient scapegoat or a convenient, um, uh, yeah, a convenient scapegoat to, to, to take the blame for someone else's failure, you know, in China's case, it was Mao, then you're the one that's going to suffer for it. So the unfortunate thing is that Everyone can conceivably be part of a group that can conceivably be, be be blamed for something, for doing something wrong, and for having some unforgivable um, feature or sin associated with them. And that is very dangerous. And most people, I don't think there's anyone that would want that for themselves. Naturally, no one wants to be blamed for blamed and punished for what someone else does just because either they have the same skin color, or the same religion or the same beliefs, but people are very, some people are very willing to do that to others to, to the extent of killing them in the streets because of those same, very same things. So this is the kind of thing that, you know, these wall street bets guys, you know, they're not getting lynched in the streets or anything, but this same dynamic is what we're seeing. And this is the direction that these things go. So it's, it is, even though it's just a bunch of wall street betting bros, seemingly and and well more than that now um it still is a sign of what's going on in the things to come and this is a very similar dynamic if you notice with facebook uh reddit telegram discord well it was the same thing after january 6th mm-hmm. with not just trump but conservative groups well well with trump it was he got banned from everything but you had groups being being banned um like Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people banned on Twitter, um, Facebook, Google, all this kind of stuff, and it was this kind of this coordinated, targeted effort on either individuals or groups, and that's pretty scary. And so there's that that switch, right? You know, kind of like what we were talking about uh, with uh, the switch from essentially from wokeism being. Uh, purely an, an ideology to now being a a mask for uh, uh, subversive purposes. Uh, it's the exact same thing. Like, you know, the 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 tweet that we saw that had, you know, far right extremists on on Reddit tried to destroy the markets or what you know, however they described it. It's like these guys are are not a political collective. Like, mm-hmm. I imagine that there was quite a significant number of people. Who were on the left, who were act or actively participating in some of this. I mean, yeah. uh, they've even come out and said that this is a a mixture of um, 
oh gosh, what was it in 2011? The Occ- Occupy Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. A, a mixture of Occupy Wall Street and Trumpist populism. I mean that they're coming out and saying like that, that this is a. a yeah. Here's a bipartisan thing. Here's something everyone can agree on. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's something that everybody can agree on. So you can't throw out the label of far-right extremists with any sincerity. But that's the thing. They're not being sincere. Like, and that's the and whole point. And they can't do it. And they can't do it. They, and they will do it. Yeah, and they, they can and, and they will do it uh, regardless. But it's just kind of like the people who are cheering for this, these types of... Uh, banning of conservative viewpoints on Facebook and Twitter and, and, and everything because they've bought into the woke notion that uh, conservatism is far-right extremism. Cheering this on is a very dangerous game to play because then you run the risk of, you know, as this Overton window gets shifted farther and farther, well, now, like, you know, you could be, like, on the far left right now but given time, you could be on the outside of that window, and then you're the one who's being canceled mm-hmm. for something that, you know, today seems reasonable by far left standards, but tomorrow is, you know, totally outside the pale. And it's and that's another reason why the whole, like, backwards revision of history and judging history by today's standards, that's why it's just not a good idea. Because then you you become held to standards that you're you don't know like that you can't know Mm -hmm. really uh so that's just another one of those like this is dangerous guys we shouldn't be toying with this well it it's kind of a uh this tool this aggressive tool that's meant to knock you back on your heels or to at least create the impression among the impressionable uh the individuals who have no kind of context or understanding for the news watching that this is really a white supremacist or uh, or evil action among people. Anyone who does this sort of thing happens to be a uh, a racist individual. There, there is no there's you know people are being uh, misled as you said earlier. They're being redirected to think about certain news events in a certain way. And getting back to Occupy Wall Street which might have been the last kind of viable movement that was gaining traction uh, from the left in 2011. Uh, This was a response to Wall Street being bailed out in 2008 after the subprime mortgage fiasco and and, uh, all of the the kind of uh, ridiculous uh, trades that were being that were putting banks into uh, jeopardy and that ultimately hurt, uh, you know, everyone who had money in a 401k or, or who was being led to believe that their, their investments were actually sound investments. Uh, So you had this, this liberal movement in in 2011 that was gaining traction. And uh, what happened soon after Uh, you had identity politics being, being force-fed into the minds of, of, of individuals who actually had a very good gripe and approach to, um, well, it's arguable how, how good an approach it was, but it was certainly a good, a good thing to bring awareness to and to point out. So that, that's how it's been used, uh, this uh, critical race theory, to steer the left from more viable causes and strategies uh, to address certain real issues that that have affected tens of millions of people in the U.S. And I did just want to get back to uh, the second tweet we had up, Adam, because um, the the second tweet on white supremacy was a response to an article in I think it was the Washington Post. Uh, which was an opinion piece written by a woman who who starts off by looking at a picture of an individual in the Capitol on January 6th with a Confederate flag. And, you know, the connections that she makes in trying to paint everything that happened that on that day as a, 
a manifestation or or um, or uh, a kind of um, outgrowth of white supremacy uh, is ridiculous. And the way she does this is she tells a sad story of her family um, and some people who were killed by a, a racist with a gun and with a Confederate flag, or there's a Confederate flag somewhere in the imagery of that story, and, and ties all of that with this picture of a man with a Confederate flag in the Capitol building and conflates these two elements into something that is supposed to mean that that anyone with a confederate flag would therefore have a gun and therefore be white supremacist and therefore be more likely to to kill people that's essentially the 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 connection that she tries to uh create in the reader's mind and what it is is an appeal to the emotions it's meant to bypass any kind of you know, reasonable, critical thought about who Trump supporters are, by and large, and uh, how many of them may actually be racist or not racist. And, and so uh, this is, a, um, again, a very dangerous sign when, you know, these ideas, that, you know, they, they're still calling it the insurrection on January 6th, the, the coup attempt, the directed uh, aggression by Trump against Congress. I mean, it, and, and even among journalists and analysts that in general have a, a fairly good picture of things, to, you know, to hear uh, a Finian Con- Cunningham use these terms to describe what happened on January 6th, it, you know, it's disappointing because uh, you, you get the sense that even some of the most critical uh, thinkers out there who, who make a living in the alternative spheres of news are, are not getting, <laughs> they're missing some crucial things here. Um, so that tweet in particular uh, is also um, really instructive, I think, and, and tells us how it's, how it's being used to bypass critical thinking and appeal to emotions because how can you argue with a writer who lost you know family to racists who were killed by guns how can you not have a certain amount of sympathy for her experience uh for her history and 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 want some kind of uh if not revenge then some kind of uh you know compensation or you know it's it's a lot like you know, never again among many uh, Jewish people in the Holocaust. At what cost is never again? Does that mean you're going to uh, act aggressively, uh, preemptively to to everyone who, you know, you perceive to be a potential enemy on on some level, where, you know, where where you're going to effectively do to others what you are effectively doing to others? What you claim you want never done to yourself is that the is that the the moral uh, of the story is that the lesson learned? Well, that's actually how a lot of well, I'd guess I don't know the numbers. I'd guess it would be a lot of people how they actually how some people I'll say it that way become racist or become or it's the same phenomenon as like a blood feud or a or seeking revenge. Um, and you find this in ethnic conflicts all over the world for, you know, as far back as I've been able to look in history, where let's say um, some, uh, what's, a, what's a fictional country? Dirk Durkistan. No, no, I'll go, some, someone like a Middle Earther. You know, right. Someone from Middle Earth, you know, kills your family, right? It's very natural to then for, for the, let's say the, for that family member, the survivor, to then hate all Middle Earthers, right? And especially if there's been a conflict between Middle Earth and uh, Upper Earth <laughs> for uh, like for generations, there will there will be uh, an ethnic tension, and and you'll you'll very easily see generalizations made. It's like, oh, those Middle Earthers, you know, 
um, you know, well, you see what they, what they did to my family, right? But so we have this here in that story when it sounds like you have the same dynamic playing out, but it was a, an evil Southern racist gun owner. And the, the dynamic is the same where there seems to then be an ex, uh, a generalization made from that fact that, oh, you know, well, it's, it's not too far um, to, to make the generalization that all Southerner gun owners are murderers and maybe even all Southerners uh, are, are murderers and, or, or potentially, it's very easy to make that generalization from, from a, a single example. So it doesn't, an example like that might tug at the heartstrings and it, and it, and it is a tragedy, but it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't do anything, at least for me to extend, expand, expand that category of, or to, to use that emotion to expand the category of people I should, um, dislike for one reason or another. Like if an individual commits a crime, does something nasty, then I will have certain feelings and thoughts about that individual. Mm Mm-hmm. That's pretty much where it ends. So, oh, you're worried about that in- individual? Well, tell me about them. Let me form my, my thoughts and my opinions and my feelings about that person on like that specific person. Like, that, that bullshit doesn't work on me to, to try to get me to, um, to hate or, um, yeah, to, to like or to, to support policies against any group of people just because of what one other person did what did that what did the what did each individual in that group that you're talking about actually do okay i might be okay agree agree disagree agree disagree but it never the the analysis never approaches that because that requires some actual time and thought and energy as opposed to just oh all those people are evil yeah and that was uh something that uh Lobachevsky talks a little bit about in Ponderology about the necessity for the understanding of just the human condition and human nature. Because when you start to di- diverge from that understanding of, you know, humans are fallible and, you know, some individuals are just shitty people and some of them are really good. And you find those two, you know, types of people and everything in between in every culture on the planet forever and always. There will always be good people on on this group and always be people who are malevolent in uh, every other group. It's, you know, you can't just say all Middle Earthers are evil because it's not true. Uh, And you can't say the same about uh, Upper Earthers either because, you know, again, it's not true. Uh, So we really have to... uh, Parse things out. Yeah, parse things out and take a step back and make sure that we're not allowing ourselves to get manipulated into supporting things that, you know, aren't actually uh, genuinely good or uh, justified or justifiable. And you know what the, you know what the darned irony of all of this is? Uh, I've, I've mentioned this on the show previously. Um, you know, well, I'll start this way. Right now we're looking at a, a Biden administration that is a replay of Biden Harris administration. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Get it right. Do they, better. Do better, Elon. They, uh, build back better, Elon. <laughs> yes. Well, here it comes, okay? <laughs> Mistakes are not. Uh, what we're looking at right now is the reconstitution of the Obama administration in in part. A neoliberal, neoconservative war hawking, uh, aggressive regime change, uh, coup installing, uh, overt aggression or overt aggressive um, kind of uh, tool for hegemony and, and power projection across the entire world. Be it soft power, be it military, you get the idea. You have guys like James Clapper, former head of the NSA, who have gone on air to talk about how the Russians are subhuman and sneaky and untrustable, right? You you have it right out of the, the security establishment's mouth. That is, if it isn't white supremacy per se, it is a, a kind of real uh, ultra-pathological arrogance that that is 
a, a type of supremacy that reflects a type of thinking that these individuals in the Biden administration agree with uh, in their statements. It's all it's all right there. Russia can't be trusted. Russia doesn't do well for its people. Russia is tyrannical. Russia doesn't have freedom and democracy. And and the purpose for these statements is to help make the case and justify the U.S.'s own aggression towards Russia. And so you said a few moments ago, Harrison, that, uh, uh, or maybe it was you, Adam, that um, it's not sincere. Their accusations of, of white supremacy, their projection onto everyone else as this tool for, uh, for locking people down and shutting them up and vilifying them and demonizing them. Of course it's not sincere because they themselves are guilty in some sense, not maybe not in a racial sense, maybe, maybe not in as across-the-board way as, as Clapper would seem to suggest in his statement that Russians are subhuman. But there is this, um, they, they are the ultimate uh, white supremacists, for lack of a better term. They are the ultimate um, uh, people who are, are trying to accrue power to themselves uh, and use any tool with which to do it. And they're already guilty of it, and they already plan to do a lot more. It's already in the works. They're chomping at the bit. They're drawing their plans. They're making their statements. They they're they're signing executive orders. We're we're going to see how wokeism, as used by this current government, is the ultimate camouflage for what is truly some really evil shit coming down the pike. And uh, and I think that's you know when 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 you put those two pieces together. I think that really kind of, at least for me, solidifies the understanding of of what this is about in some sense. Yeah, I really think that, uh, you know, like you were just saying there, we can just expect more accusations of domestic terrorism, uh, more accusations of white supremacy, more accusations of sexism. Uh, all of these different accusations that, you know, have come out of the wokeism playbook just expect them to, you know, get thrown around more and more and to become less and less relevant to whatever it is that they're actually talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably yeah. going to be the bigger thing is that it's just going to become less and less relevant mm -hmm. and more and more just a bald face lie yeah. uh, and more power and grab. Transparently bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so if any of you guys have anything else you wanted to... No, Wrap I think that, was, that wrapped it up pretty well. Mm -hmm. All right. Sounds good. Um, appreciate you guys uh, listening in and tuning in. And uh, be sure to hit the like, subscribe, you know, hit the little notification bell, and uh, share it around the social media spheres. Um, and uh, y'all take care because this is going to get very, very interesting.